mighty act. Glad y'all can make it out on this beautiful Thursday day. Hallelujah. Y'all go ahead and let's stand up and get service started. Turn over to page 138. 138. I'm glad to know that God did his love in my heart. Oh my. <laughs> Woo! I knew what love was then. Up to then, I didn't know what love truly was. But when he dipped in and he put himself in me, cleaned me up, hallelujah, he let me know what love's all about, amen. Stop. If you know him tonight, sing out tonight. When God gives his feet
I'll tell you what, just flip over to page 139 right there next to that. Amen. Let's do it now. something for for the youth he said several months ago I became intensely burdened about having a meeting for our young adults and youth designed to perpetrate um, did I read that right to further anyways the old-fashioned Baptist worship among this generation I'm fully aware that many of you share the same burden therefore I'm thrilled to announce the inaugural still old-fashioned teen camp meeting to be held at our church my desire is to see teens and young adults from churches of like precious faith come together and worship in the old-time way to preserve what we have learned from the King James Bible and spirit-filled singing and preaching down through the ages and so on and so forth. So uh, I'll be going down there tomorrow night to preach at 7 o'clock. Uh, if anybody would like to go with me, any young people like to go, and that includes, it will take any adults that even want to go, but uh, young teenagers and young adults, or adults. We'll take anybody who wants to go. We'll leave here probably tomorrow around 5.30, maybe 5.15. Probably 5.15 we more to shoot for that because sometimes traffic in Gastonia gets all messed up. 
So if you'd like to go with us down there, it's going to be real good. I'm excited about the meeting. So if you'd like to go, please see me or see Miss Tristan after the service. Let me know so that way we'll know how to prepare. Me, my, me and my family will be going. And so um, anybody else would like to go is more than welcome to do so. Uh, anybody that's got any issues with trees down, power out, and needs some help on anything, come see me and let me know. I want to try and help the church out any way we can. Did anybody have anything? I know that Moses has had stuff blow down. Did anybody else have stuff blow down today, get tore up? Nobody else did? Praise God. Maybe y'all just ain't living right. Glory to God. I know Miss Amanda is. It must be Brother Jacob and Brother Ivy. That's what it is right there. Praise God. <laughs> Now, uh, so uh, I know a lot of stuff float around today, but um, I'll tell you what I'd like to do tonight. We're going to do something a little bit different for our prayer time. Instead of taking up prayer requests this evening, if you've got a burden or prayer request on your heart, you're more than welcome to pray about that uh, between you and the Lord tonight. But I'll tell you what I'm really burdened about that I'd like to just say a few things to you here for the next couple minutes, and then I want the whole church that will to gather around the altar and pray. Tuesday is election day, and uh, I, I, I want everybody to understand something. Let me make this qualifying statement before I go on any farther, because I want everybody to understand where I'm at. Regardless of who wins the election for the presidency and all the Senate races on Tuesday, regardless of who wins it, my God will still be on the throne Amen. at the end of all of it. I want everybody to understand I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in some fear-mongering tank that Man, you know, something goes wrong and don't go the way that I'd like it to go. That You know, it's just all doom and gloom and it's over. I, look, if, if Biden wins the election and that wacko that he's got running with him, if they win the election, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come back in Thursday and come back in Sunday and I'm going to shout and I'm going to worship. I'm going to preach the same Bible, lift up the same Jesus. It's not going to deter my walk with God any. Uh, but I, I want, I, so with that being said, let me say this. This election that we are facing uh, this year, it's not just it's not just Democrat, Republican, it's not just right versus left. The lines are so separated now and the left have gone so far left. Uh, brother, this is an election of good and evil. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking this evening, brother, what, what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and their cronies stand for is the height of evil. I mean, brother, everything that our Bible is for and our God stands for, they stand absolutely opposite to this evening. Everything that made our country great, they are absolutely anti that. Amen. They're, they're anti all of it. And uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to stand here for a minute and tell you that President Trump is a saved man and walks with God. I don't necessarily believe that, but I do believe this. I do believe that God has raised up leaders in different times and eras in the past that they may not be saved, but God raises him, them up to give his people liberty to be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. And our president we have now is absolutely pro-religious liberty. And, uh, and brother, I, I, I'm just... The longer that I'm looking at this thing and seeing it, and I've already cast my vote. We went and early voted last week, and so I've already thrown mine in. If you haven't voted, please, please go do this, okay? This is important. This is absolutely important. If you've never voted before, I don't know how much more time you got to register and then vote. I think it ends this week. I think it ends on the 30th to be able to register and vote. So uh, that'd be, that's tomorrow. So if you haven't done it, you need to go. If you're not registered, go register tomorrow and vote tomorrow. But if, if, you're, if you are registered and you haven't voted, go do it. But, brother, we're, we're, we're facing something right now that, uh, thank God for the three justices that President Trump got put on the Supreme Court so far in his first, that, that's huge for our country. Yeah. That means for my kids' future that there'll be some people on the Supreme Court that's going to side with religious liberty, with conservative values. Right. But, brother, a, a, a vote towards the other way is absolutely to endorse uh, full-blown same-sex marriage in your face and, and where it will end up being a hate. Everything that the left wants is to make us, listen now, they want to make us just like Europe or just like Canada. Well, I don't know if y'all seen what happens in Europe and Canada, but there is no real religious liberty in those places. Amen. If a pastor stands up in those pulpits and actually preaches the Word of God and decries and uh, uh, preaches against same-sex marriage and homosexuality and abortion and things of this nature, these things can be considered hate crimes. And they can come and arrest the pastor. They can come and shut the church down. That's happening across the globe. 
I don't know if you've seen this either, but in France, they're talking about right now, I was watching today, in France, they are preparing for a huge Islamic wave of terror right now. They just came out, the leaders in France said so. Just today, they had a radical Islamist that walked into a church and began to hack people up, cut one lady's head off and stabbed two other ones. Now, the reason why, you say, what's that got to do with us? Just hang with me. The reason why that happened is because the wacko liberal policies of Europe opened their borders to these Islamics to come in and give them full liberty to practice Sharia law and do whatever they want. And Islamics, listen to me, Muslims don't assimilate into your culture. They come in and make you like them. And the Democrats for years have wanted us to do the same thing they've done. They have absolutely hammered President Trump because he wouldn't just let all of these Muslim refugees and immigrants come in our country and, 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 and assimilate us into them. He's holding this stuff at bay. You let them get in office, and brother, it's going to be Katie bar the door. Katie bar the door. You look at what's going on in Philadelphia right now. Because an armed black man who is a thug tried to harm police with a knife and they shot him and now they're rioting and burning things down and acting the fool. Brother, that's the mindset of the liberal left. And I promise you, friend, you don't think this thing's going to have consequences. It'll have major consequences if, if the right is not put back in. And so I understand God will still be on the throne and I'm going to still preach and I'm going to still worship and still have myself a time. But I'll tell you what it worries me about is for the next generation. My children and my children's children having to live in a society that these wackos are running. And, uh, and brother, I told some men this a minute ago, and we're fixing to pray. But I'm going to tell you this too. This stuff, even with coronavirus and these masks, you listen to what I'm telling you. After being in two different airports uh, four different times, one going and then coming, so I was in these airports four different times this past week, Charlotte and Denver. As far as I know, my wife and I were the only people in both of those airports with thousands of people that was not wearing a mask in the airports. Everybody had them on. Now, I want you all to understand something. I walked up to a McDonald's this morning and stepped up to the counter to order a sausage biscuit in, uh, air, in the airport in Denver at a McDonald's. The person behind the counter had a mask on and a piece of plexiglass that thick, that wide, and that tall between us, and she said, you can't order anything. I said, why not? I said, you ain't got a mask on. Before she even let me order my sausage biscuit between the flex guys, I had to put a mask on to do it. Y'all listen to me. The mask is a prelude to the mark. If you don't think so, it's because you haven't been out enough. You, you, are, you are just honed in on one little spot here. Out in the real world, brother, they're looking at this thing like a virtue signal thing. You don't got a mask? You don't got a mask? Well, you're, you're, not, you're not going along with the flow. You're not protecting us. It is a prelude to the mark of the beast. And the left is doing everything they can to push this, push this, push this. So what I'm saying tonight is one vote. And even before you vote, pray, pray. And so we're going to pray tonight. We're going, we're going, instead of taking prayer requests, if you've got a burden, I want you to give that to the Lord. But the main thing I want our church to do tonight is everybody that can and will, I want you to get around this altar tonight and let's all pray. Let's pray that the Lord... Uh, averts the threatening danger that could be heading our way, that God gives us a stay of relief. I believe he did it in 2016. I believe he can do it again in 2020. And so let's pray tonight that God, uh, you, you say, well, preacher, God's going to do what God wants to do. I've heard that. Let me say something to that. I've heard people say prayer don't change nothing. I, I don't believe that. I read over in the Bible where it said that Hezekiah got a death sentence from the Lord. God said, you're going to die. And Hezekiah rolled over to the wall and got a hold of God, and God turned his man around, walked back into the palace and said, God said, I'm going to give you, what, 16, 17 more years. Because he prayed. God stayed his judgment because somebody prayed. And uh, I know judgment's coming on this nation, but I'd just like to be part of the crowd that keeps it stayed for as long as we can by praying and seeking the face of God, okay? So this is what I'd like for us to do. Let's come to this altar tonight. Let's have to just play something softly over there. Let's gather around this altar, everybody that can and that will. And if you want to turn your pew into an altar, that's fine too. Let's gather in here tonight and seek the face of God. Can you pray with me? Let's pray for our country. This is serious, y'all. This is serious stuff. Let's pray tonight. Let's get a hold of heaven tonight. Let's call on God tonight. He is able and he wants to hear from us this evening. Let's pray.
Our Father, as we close in prayer tonight and as your people have called on you at this altar and make their way back to their seats, God, we ask you this evening that you may hear the prayers of your people. God, you said, call unto me. God, God, we didn't say this. You said this. Call unto me, and I'll answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Lord, you said that our God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power which worketh in us. God, tonight I pray that you would do something in this election that would stop the mouths of those that would try and destroy our nation, our heritage, our history. All of those things, Lord, in our past that point toward Jesus and point towards an unseen hand of a heavenly Father. God, I pray that you would let those things come back to the light again. In so many of our schools and colleges, they are trying to stifle the good, goodly and godly heritage that our country uh, has failed and experienced. I pray our young people would see it once again and hear it once again. God, I realize America has her faults and has her failures and has her sins. God, I'm sorry for them. Lord, I'm sorry for all the blood of all the innocent babies that's been shed in this country for the last many years. God, I know it's a stench in the nostrils of God. Lord, to hear the voice of the unborn crying out, their blood's on our hands. God, I pray that you would stop those that would try and murder millions more. God, I realize the sins of sodomy and pornography and other things that are a stench in the nostrils of God have made its way across our country and have become the norm and become accepted. God, I pray that you would give us freedom to be able to still preach the Bible and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I realize to the world it's foolishness and to the world, Lord, they don't understand it. But God, does what you're saying is the power of God. Help us, Lord. I pray that you would protect us, God. Lord, we pray that you would help us in this election. I pray, God, that you would stop the liberal radical left. God, you would install President Trump for four more years. We'll not think a man. We'll not think a movement. We'll not think a party. Lord, I promise you, I'll look toward heaven, raise my hand and say, Lord, thank you. We'll know where it come from. We'll know where it come from. Father, we pray you do it one more time. We'll give you the glory. Hear the prayers of your people tonight that we've humbly offered and asked. We've asked it all in that name above every name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, church, for praying tonight. Brother Skip, give us one more good song, if you would, my brother. Amen. Psalms 46 and 4 says this. There is a river. The streams where shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Ephesians 2.13 says this. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were afar off, are made nigh by what? By the blood of Christ. I don't know why my soul has been so exceedingly sorrowful today. But as I was sitting there picking out these songs this evening, I was reading one of my prayers out of, out of the book Brother Tom had told me about long ago. I got to hear this prayer book. And in that prayer, and I had never read this prayer until today, it talked about that fountain that he come to, that, that old evangelist would come to to get his sins forgiven and washed. Amen. Turn over to page 379. Let's stand tonight. I just want to remind you there is a fountain filled with blood. On the cross of Calvary, it was drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And when sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty stains. I thank God back in April 1994, when he saved my soul, he plunged me underneath that blood, brought me up clean and white as snow. He put light in me where there was darkness <laughs> that I might know His love. Amen tonight. So I pray if you know Him tonight, 
sing this song. If you don't, you can know him tonight. Even out there on the internet, you can know him tonight. Today's the day of salvation. There is a fountain that will clean you, Lord, tonight. What our country needs. I, my prayer is that God would put the President Trump back in and flip the house up there. And then you know what I pray for? There'd be some preaching and some praying go back on in that place up there where it wants us to happen. That that place would get cleaned out and cleaned up up there. Amen. Amen. All right, y'all ready to see?
singing tonight. I'm glad that's still the truth. I'm glad that the blood that was shed 2,000 years ago on the old rugged cross is still enough to save. It's still enough to cleanse. It's still enough to pardon and buy every sinner that will come to God. Aren't you glad for that tonight? I'm glad for the day I didn't get whitewashed. I got blood washed, friend. I didn't just get washed in a baptistry pool. Son, I got washed in the blood. The Bible said unto him, Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. Brother, you want to talk about some real blood? The Bible said it was not just the blood of a man, it was the blood of God. The Bible said in the book of Acts chapter number 20, around verse number 28, he said Paul told him to uh, be overseers of the flock of God which he hath purchased. God hath purchased with his own blood. God's blood. <laughs> the blood of God bought us, man. What a thought that is. Well, I want you to take your Bibles tonight. We're going to the book of Genesis in chapter number 22. Genesis in chapter number 22. And I believe this is part number 7, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken of our study on finding Jesus in Genesis. I told you a couple of weeks ago, the last time we did uh, one of our studies in Genesis looking at Jesus here, we looked at Isaac and we looked at Jesus in the birth, in that miracle birth of Isaac, the son of Abraham, how he is a picture even in his birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But tonight we're going to Genesis chapter number 22. And we're going to see Jesus tonight in the burnt offering. Jesus in the burnt offering. Let's read several verses here together in Genesis chapter 22. We'll start in verse number 1 and we'll read several verses together. If you found your place with me, say amen. amen. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. A lot of your modern Bible versions will change verse number 1 and take the word tempt out because the Bible says that God doesn't tempt any man. But in the text where it says that, it says God doesn't tempt any man with sin. Neither can be tempted. God's not tempting Abraham with sin here. If you compare the passage in the New Testament, it said God tried him. This is not a temptation to sin, like the devil would throw some temptation out in your path to try and get you to sin. This is a temptation or a trying to see if you're going to follow God or not. So there's no reason to change the text. Anyways, verse number 2. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. He's going to use this word several times down through here. And you'll see why I titled it Jesus in the burnt offering. Offering there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? The cry of the Old Testament is, where is the lamb? The cry of the New Testament is, behold the lamb. John said, behold the lamb of God. And the cry in eternity is, worthy is the lamb. Revelation chapter number 5. Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. We'll mess with that later on in the message. So they went both of them together and they came to the place which God had told him of and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him upon the altar, uh, on the altar upon the wood and Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God 
seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Lord, I need your help to preach tonight now. God, I pray that you'd take all these thoughts and these uh, uh, the things that I've studied in the Scripture that we put down on paper. God, I pray that you'd make them more than just words on a page. I pray, Lord, that you'd take what's in my heart and you'd give it to God's people. Take my little five loaves and two fishes and bless them, break them, and make them go farther to feed this multitude than I ever could or dreamed they could. God, we'll thank you for what you do tonight. Help us to stand in awe. Help us to stand in adoration at the sacrifice of God's only Son. Help us to stand tonight as we leave and say, what a Savior, what a God, what a Lord, what a King, what a Redeemer. God, I pray that we leave out with such a desire to tell somebody else about this Jesus that gave everything for us so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Help us not expound the Scriptures to the heart of God's people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Jesus tonight in the burnt offering. I would dare say the most beautiful picture of Calvary the most beautiful picture of Golgotha, the most beautiful picture of Jesus Christ sacrificing himself as an offering for the sins of mankind, the most beautiful picture of that in the Old Testament is what I just got done reading to you for 14 verses. I think the greatest picture of that, the greatest type of Calvary, is found in Genesis in chapter 22. You'll look far and wide and you'll find many other pictures and many other types. And we've already exposed them to you in the previous 21 chapters. You'll find some great ones after this. Uh, not only in Genesis but other books. But you'll never find a better picture of Jesus Christ dying for the sins of the world on Calvary than Genesis chapter 22. And they all want you to understand something. There's so much in this chapter, I'm going to give you as much as I can. But I promise you this, if you with an open heart will go sit down and let the Holy Ghost guide you, you'll find stuff in here that I ain't even seen. Brother, there's, there's so much rich, deep, wonderful truths about Jesus Christ in Genesis 22 and them four, first 14 verses that it's just a gold mine without end. I mean, it's a treasure trove that you just can't get to the end of. Now, I'm just going to highlight some of them tonight as we look at Isaac and his father here in this Jesus in the burnt offering. This, this boy, Isaac, he, he was the promised seed. We looked at that last time. He was that promised birth, that phenomenal birth, that prophetic birth. But here now we find that boy that was promised, that boy that was prophesied that would come, that boy that had that awesome birth. Now he is called on to die. Uh, he is called on to give his life. And he's a picture of Christ. And this is also one of those great texts in Scripture. We'll get to it later on. This is one of those great pictures that has a double type in it. You say, what do you mean a double type? Well, there's two types of Jesus Christ in this chapter. One is Isaac. He's the main type here. He's the picture of Jesus. But as we get towards the end of our text and the end of our verses, we find not only is Isaac a picture of Jesus, but that ram that gets caught in the thicket by his horns. He's also a picture of Jesus. There's two types of Jesus in one chapter, uh, the first 14 verses. I mean, you couldn't miss it unless you just tried this evening. And so we're going to look at these things tonight. And I want to show you three things out of this text that relates to our Lord is Jesus in the burnt offering. Firstly, we'll see the love of the Father. Secondly, we'll see the life of the Son. And lastly, we'll see the lending, the lending or the loaning of the Lord. First, let's look at the love of the Father. Boy, I like this. Look, look at your Bible tonight and verse number two. The Lord is talking to Abraham and he says this. Look at the love of the Father firstly. In verse 2 he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou, don't miss this word, lovest. Here we find the love of the Father in a couple of things. The first way we find the love of the Father is we find the love of the Father in a person. The Father loves a person tonight. Now I don't know how much you study your Bible. I hope you do. I hope you read it. And I hope you study it. But here when we get to Genesis 22, we'll find a law of first mention. The first mention of a word in the Bible is always real important. Do you realize this is the first place in the Bible you find the word love mentioned? 
The first place in your Bible that you find the word love mentioned, it is uh, the greatest love when God wanted to highlight love. When God really wanted to show us what love is all about, he did not show us the love of a man for a woman, even though that's wonderful in Adam and Eve, but he don't use the word love. When God really wants to deal with love, he does not use love as it relates from a woman to a man. Ladies, can I even say this? And I know we hype this up a lot in our in our uh, society, and I'm all about it, but when God got ready to really deal with love, it wasn't even a mother's love for a child. Do you know what the greatest love that God could say was in the Bible? The greatest love in the Bible is a father's love for his son this evening. You say, why did God show that the greatest love and the first time he's going to use love is it relates to a father and a son because that's a picture of God's love to his son this evening. And then it goes beyond that here just momentarily. The greatest love God had was towards his only son. Now I want to say this too about this right here, how we see Jesus in it. Did you notice what God said? This ain't what Abraham said. This is what God said in verse 2. He said, take now thy son, thine only son. Time out. Abraham got two sons. Don't he? Yeah. He got one by Hagar too. He ain't got just one. He got two sons. But when it comes right here, God doesn't even recognize Ishmael. God doesn't even recognize that he's got another son. That first son talked about was after the flesh. He's a picture of Adam, that first man that's earthy. And brother, he puts him out of the way, said, I ain't even recognizing that. And he calls him his only son in the text. Well, I read somewhere, that, that sounds familiar to me. As a matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11, do you know there's only two instances in the Bible where God uses this language? One's in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, I believe it's verse number 17. It said, that, it said that Isaac was Abraham's only begotten son. You know that's only used in the Bible twice where it says the only begotten son. Only used about twice. Once is when it refers to Isaac being Abraham's only begotten son and the other is, you know it, John chapter 3 verse number 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Brother, you couldn't miss the picture here. You realize a lot of them types that we've looked at when it relates to Jesus in Genesis and when you go through your Bible, you know what you normally see? You only see the son. You only see that picture of Christ. That's most of the time the only thing you see. But Brother Fred, in this text, it's like God peels back the layers and God opens up the veil and God lets us see the Father. He lets us see Himself in the story. This is one of the only pictures of Jesus dying where we see the Father included as well. We find how God, the Father, works in and through His Son's sacrifice tonight. You say, preacher, why did God use this love, this love word firstly, not as it relates to a mother loving a child, but a father loving a son? Well, I'd just be honest with you. I'd say this. I dare say if God told Sarah to do this, I doubt she'd have done it. Ladies, I love you with all my heart, but the fact is, I was told this all my life, and it's still the truth. I live with a woman, and I live with four of them, as a matter of fact. A woman's center of rule is her heart. And a man's center of rule is his head. You say, I don't believe that. Well, just watch how watch the reactions on a football field when a son's down there playing football and, and a big linebacker knocks and cleans some boy's clock off. You know what dad does? Dad jumps up and says, get up, boy. Get up, dust yourself off. Go at it. You know what he's doing? He's instilling character in that boy. Life's going to knock you down. It won't always be. Get up. You know what mama does? Oh, is he all right? Oh, come, come here. Let me hug you. That, that ain't going to help him none. That ain't going to help him none. That's going to teach him to quit it. That ain't going to help. But that's a mother's reaction. There's nothing wrong with that. And if God had come to Sarah and said, Hey, Sarah, I want you to take that boy out there and I want you to kill him. Sarah said, Not my baby. You ain't getting mine. But when he come to the father, the father said, I love God enough and I know that God will do something enough that I, I'll do it, God. If that's what you want, God. I, I don't understand it, but I ain't going to reason it with my heart. I'm going to reason it with my head this evening. And it's a picture of the father's love toward the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, hold your place in Genesis 22 and look at this love. Oh, it's highlighted for us all the way in 1 John. That's the love book in the Bible. Go to 1 John. Look at what real love is. I love this. Look at real love in 1 John chapter number. Well, we'll look at 1 John 3.16. You know what John 3.16 is? 
Now look at 1 John 3.16. I'd say 1 John 3.16 is every bit as good as John 3.16. Look at what it said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 16. If you go to Revelation and come back just a few books, you'll find Jude, 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. 1 John 3.16, Hereby perceive we the love of God. How do we see God's love? You see it just like you saw it in Genesis 22. Because He, God... This is the love of God because He, God in the person of Jesus Christ, because He laid down His life for us. Come to chapter 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 9. Watch what it said. Chapter 4 verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love. You want to know what love is? Here it is. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son, that one that He loves, sent His Son to be the propitiation. The word propitiation means the atonement. He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Isn't that a real love right there? I mean, look at here. God loved His Son, but here we see another love. God loves more persons. He don't just love His only begotten Son. Now I'm one of His sons this evening. Now God's only got one begotten Son. In other words, He was born into the world. But now that I'm saved, I'm His Son. Look at this love, how the love was transferred to me. Look at chapter 3, verse 1 of 1 John. Chapter 3 and verse number 1. Watch what He said. Behold, chapter 3, verse 1, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the what? The sons of God. Y'all realize tonight, just like God loved Jesus Christ, just like the Father loved His Son, I am now one of His sons. I am now in Christ. And because of His sacrifice and because He died for me, now I am one of His children. Now I'm one. And the same love He has for Jesus Christ, He has that same love for me tonight, friend. What a love. We well, see this love of the Father was in a person. Not only was the love for the Father we see is in this person. He, he bestows his love on Isaac. And because of Isaac's sacrifice, now you and I get in. Because of the sacrifice of Christ, we get in on the blessings. I, I read a story one time. I told it here maybe a year or two ago. And I'll never forget it. This is a story that haunts me as a father. And they claim that it was a true story. Uh, I don't remember what town it was, some large town that had a train track with a drawbridge. They said there was a father that went to work one morning and the son always used to like to go with his dad and uh, help him pull the levers to let the drawbridge down so the train could go over the river and then let it back up. And they said that that father was doing his business one day and one evening, late in the evening, dawning towards night, uh, he heard the whistle of the train coming and he turned around to look for his son and his son was nowhere to be found. And he looked down there, way down the train track and his son was playing down on the train track and he was too far away to be able to get his son back and save all the passengers on the train. In just a few split seconds, he had to make his mind up. Either I'm going to let this train blast through the raised drawbridge and fly off the tracks and land down yonder in the river in the channel, Either I'm going to let that happen or either I'm going to have to sacrifice my son. If I let this thing down, it's going to crush him. And they said in just a few moments, this father saw his son and saw that train coming. And he had just a few quick seconds to make his mind up what he could do. And they said that father, through tears, ducked his head and he pulled that lever and he let that bridge come down, crushing his only son. They said that train come by him, and as the train came by him, he looked inside the window. And there were people in the window laughing, and they was drinking, and they was smoking cigars, and they was playing cards, and they was falling asleep against the window. And they said that father was so brokenhearted, he began to holler at the train as it passed by. He hollered, don't you even know that I sacrificed my own son to save your life? Don't you care that I killed my own boy so that you didn't have to die? And 
obviously they didn't hear him. They just kept right along their merry way. And you know the truth is tonight that I believe God must look down from heaven at this world going to sleep in sin and this world just going about their merry way doing their own thing. And God said, don't you know I sacrificed my own son? Don't you know I delivered my own son to be killed? Don't you know I allowed him to die just for you? Hey, my boy died for you tonight. What love God would give this evening for him. We see this love of the Father not only in a person, but this love of the Father is also in his preparation. Now, I'm not going to take much time on this, but let me just throw it out so I can get to the rest of the message. Look back at our text in Genesis 22. I won't belabor this, but, but you do need to hear this. We see his love also in his preparation. Look at verse number 3. Verse number 3, after God tells him to sacrifice his son. Verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, Isaac his son, clave, or he cut or chopped the wood for the burnt offering, rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. You say, what's that got to do with God the Father? Oh, we find Abraham rises up early. In other words, it gives the indication that early in the morning, before anybody else had got up, Abraham already had the plan set in motion. Abraham was already carrying out the plan that was delivered to him. You know what the Bible said over in Acts chapter number 2? When Peter got to preaching, brother, like a prayer fire going wild over there to them Jews, he said that Jesus Christ was delivered to them by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. The Bible said over in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we weren't redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Brother, early in time, early before Adam, good God, before Adam ever put his first footprint on planet Earth, God already knew what would happen. God already knew mankind would fall. And early in time, God was already setting the pieces of the puzzle in place so that one day his son would come forth, give his life, and die for sinners like us. Brother, the cross, the cross was not plan B. It was plan A. The cross didn't catch God off guard. Hey, when Jesus died on the cross, God wasn't sitting up there saying, hmm, I didn't see that coming. No, it was the fulfillment of the plan of the ages that God would reconcile fallen man back to himself tonight. The love of the Father in this Jesus in the burnt offering, we not only see the love of the Father, secondly, can I say we see the life of the Son. Now, I like this. Isaac's life, not just his birth, but his life in this text pictures our Lord. You say, how does Isaac's life picture the Lord? Well, we see his life pictures the Lord in his respect. His respect to his father. His obedience. Look what your Bible said in verse number 6. Watch this in verse 6 of chapter 22. Look at the life of the son and his respect to his father. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. What? Don't miss this. He took the wood and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Took fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? And watch all the way down verse 9. And they came to the place which God told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. I want y'all to understand something about Isaac, something that I believe a lot of us have a misconception of. I know I did years ago. Years ago, I was studying for a whole other message. I preached one time out of Genesis 22 on... Um, uh, worship that works or something like that and talk about when the lamb shows up worship can have a lot of good preaching in this text anyways and uh, I seen something I'd never seen before I used to think brother I used to think brother Zach that Isaac in this text is some little boy you know you think and you read the lad the lad you think he's just some little toe-headed runt and it would be no big deal for Abraham to take this little old boy you know big as you know uh, uh, Tatum or Turner and tie him up bind him up and throw him on the altar but upon deeper inspection 
you'll find that when it says lad, it doesn't mean that he's just a little boy. It means he's a young man. The timeline, most people agree that this young man now is somewhere 18 or older reaching peak physical maturity. Abraham's over 100. He was 100 years old when he had Isaac. Abraham's an old, gray-headed, feeble man. Isaac is a young, strapping, fast, strong young man. He could have easily overwhelmed his daddy. He sees what's coming. He ain't dumb. Matter of fact, we know he's not dumb because he says, uh, Hey, daddy i I'm putting this in the Cody Zorn updated reader digest version. Hey, hey pops. Uh, we got wood. We got fire. We got knife. We got... We got <laughs> There ain't no lamb around here. I know you old. You, you're getting senile on me. There ain't no lamb around here. And he realizes real quick, Isaac ain't dumb. I'm the lamb. I'm going to be the one that's fixing to take this. And it says he binds him. He don't knock him over the head. Brother John, he don't clunk him. He don't catch him by surprise. It almost gives the implication in the text that Abraham lets him know what's going to happen. And Isaac says, tie me up, daddy. Tie my feet. Tie my hand. If this is what God has told you to do, I'm resigned to it. I mean, come on, let's be honest. I ain't sure that would have been me tonight. Look here, if I'm Isaac, and all of a sudden I see my 100-plus-year-old gray-headed daddy wrinkled up coming at me with a knife and some fire and some rope and said, uh, God told me that I need to sacrifice you. Let's tie you up. I mean, I've seen what happens to sacrifices if I'm Isaac. He's fixing to cut me up and burn me up. I'm probably going to say, uh, no, you have to find somebody else, Dad. I'm going home and I'm going to tell Mama what you tried to do to me. Wait till you get home. We're going to find a nice nursing home and commit you because you're crazy. I don't know what you and God have been talking about, but he ain't told me. You better pray harder that God tells me about this too. But that ain't the way the text reads. The way the text reads is simply he just says, if this is what the plan is, I'm fully resigned to it. You know what the Bible said about our Savior? It said in Isaiah 53 that like a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. In the garden of Gethsemane, as his sweat became as great drops of blood, he prayed this prayer three times. Lord, not my will, but thine be done. When he stood before Pilate, he said, For this cause came in I into the world, and to this end was I born. He said, I know what I came from. Of what I came for. I came to die. I came to do the will of my Father. And when Jesus gives his life, there is no struggle. They don't have to hold his arms down. He didn't run off through the garden when they come to get him. He didn't struggle when he was reviled. He reviled not again. They didn't have to hold him down kicking and screaming as they nailed him to the cross. He said, I lay my life down freely. No man takes it from me. I'm a giving it away. Because it's the plan of the Father. I'm being obedient. The Bible said he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross this evening. Oh, we find his respect. Look look what it said to in this respect. Verse 6 said, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. Brother Roger, we can't miss this picture. We get it. He takes the wood that has been cut down, that's been prepared, and the wood is laid upon Isaac to carry it to the top of the hill. Well, I realize and read where the Bible said that Jesus Christ carried some wood to the top of the hill too. Brother, it was laid on him from before the foundation of the world, planned by God. And the cross, the old wooden cross was laid on my Savior. And he bore it into the place of Golgotha the skull, Calvary. And they dropped it in the hall. He obeyed the will of the Father this evening. Oh, I like this. We see not only the life of the Son, in his respect. But watch this. Don't miss this. I, I about have myself a spell on the airplane this afternoon. We see the life of the son in his resurrection. <laughs> Look what your Bible said. Don't miss this. Verse 5. Abraham said unto his young men, Y'all stay here. Abide you here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. 
What's the last five words? And come again to you. Abraham knows he's going to die. Abraham knows he's got to sacrifice him. But Abraham says, I also know God's going to get him up too. I know God's going to resurrect him. Even if I take him up there and kill him, God's already told me he's the promised seed. God's already told me he's going to give me seed as the stars of heaven. So if I go up there and kill him, God's going to get him back up. There's a resurrection. You say, you're reading a little bit too much into that. No, I'm not. Hold your place. Go to Hebrews 11 with me and look at what your Bible said. Hebrews 11. It backs up what I'm saying here. Hebrews chapter 11 and, and, and verse number 18. Hebrews 11, 18. Watch it, watch it. Hebrews 11, 18 said this. Talking about Abraham and Isaac and all of this stuff on Mount Moriah. Hebrews eleven eighteen, Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Watch what I, Abraham did. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he also received him in a figure. The Bible said that Abraham knew he was going to die, but he also knew God can get him back up again. That's a picture of my Savior. Brother, look at here. God let him die, but brother, God also got him up this evening. And I want y'all to understand something. It wasn't the Romans that killed Jesus. It wasn't the Jews that killed Jesus. It was the Father that, that, that you say, I don't believe that. Isaiah, 5, Isaiah 53 verse 4 verse 6 and verse 10 said he was wounded, smitten of God and afflicted. The Bible said God, it pleased God to bruise him. God bruised his own son. Abraham's going to kill his own son. It was God doing the bruising for us. But God knew he was going to get back up. And do y'all know how many days it took Jesus to get up? Y'all know? Three days. Go back to the text and look at the day when Isaac's going to get up. Look at the day Isaac's going to get up. Verse number four. Verse four. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Isaac's going to be sacrificed and raised again the same day. And the day that he was going to get up, had he died, was the third day. I got good news for y'all. Yes, my Savior died. Yes, he was wounded for my transgressions. Yes, he shed his blood. But three days later, he didn't stay dead. God got him back up. And he's alive this evening, friend. Jesus in the burnt offering. Thank God, oh, Isaac got up. Because all them promises that God gave to Abraham are no good unless Isaac is alive. And can I tell y'all, all all the promises of God to us through Christ Jesus are no good if he did not rise from the dead. As a matter of fact, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 15. He said, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Brother Cliff, if Jesus Christ is still wrapped up as a mummy somewhere dead in the Middle East, then we are all going to hell tonight. And our faith means absolutely nothing and less than nothing. But the fact is tonight, my faith is not, my faith is valuable. My faith is worth something because my Savior is alive. He did get up and he still lives this evening. We see the Son's resurrection in the text. Hallelujah. Jesus in the burnt offering, love of the Father, life of the Son. Lastly, I'm done. We see the lending or the loaning of the Lord. Look with me, if you will, down in verse number number 13 and 14. It said in verse 13 that Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went up, took the ram, or went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Verse 14, here's the loaning, the lending. Watch what it says. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. I love that name, Jehovah Jireh. You say, preacher, what, pray tell, does the name Jehovah Jireh mean? It means the Lord will provide. Or the Lord will see to it. Either way you want to cut it, the Lord will provide. In other words, the Lord's going to give you something to provide for the need that you have. You say, what did God provide for people like us, what did he provide? Well, he provided and he lended himself. Look at your text. I told you we'd deal with this at the beginning. Go back to verse 8. Look at verse 8. Abraham said in verse 8, My son, God will provide himself. 
a lamb for a burnt offering. Not, listen to what I'm fixing to tell y'all. If I didn't know nothing else, if I didn't know nothing else but this, what I'm fixing to tell you would be enough for me to never use any other version besides the King James Bible. If I didn't know nothing else, and I know a whole lot more, but if I didn't know nothing else than what I'm fixing to tell y'all, this would be enough for me to throw every one of them funny Bibles in the waste basket and never use them again. Every one of them. The NIV, the ESV, the NLT, certainly the Message Bible, the New American Standard, all of them. You know what they do in this text right here? Either they say something like this, either they say, God will provide a sheep for a burnt offering. Well, that don't tell me nothing. And then the rest of them get real cute and they say, God shall provide for himself a lamb. But that ain't what your King James Bible said. The Bible didn't say he'd provide for himself. The Bible said God would provide himself a lamb. In other words, he's not just going to give a lamb. The lamb's going to be him. It was one of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament that God's coming and he's not just going to provide a lamb. God's going to be the lamb this evening. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 16, he said, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached on in the world, received up in the glory. The greatest mystery in the Bible is God came in the flesh, provided himself. You say, explain the God that made nebulars and star clusters and the Milky Way and the moon and the sun and the billions upon billions and trillions of stars and the galaxies in our solar system. Explain how that God could come down, be born in a teenage virgin's womb without the help of a man, the seed of the Holy Ghost, and be born a natural birth, die a physical death, but rise a victorious death. Explain. I can't explain all of it, but I believe everlasting bit of it this evening. I believe he was born of a virgin. I believe he did live a sinless life. I believe he did overcome temptation. I believe he did die on a cross for my sin. I believe he did rise again three days later. I believe he did go back to heaven. I believe he is coming back one day. Brother, he did all that he said he'd do this evening. He lended himself. He lended himself when God came to save sinners. He didn't send an angel. He didn't send a cherubim. He didn't send a seraphim. He loaned himself. We not only see the lending of the Lord, he lended himself. But here's the double type. And we're done. Here's the double type. He lended himself for the hopeless and those that were hostage. Well, look what your Bible said in verse 9. He lended for the hopeless and the hostage. Verse 9 said they came to the place which God told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Do you see what's happening here? Isaac is bound up. He can't get free. Brother Ivy, he's bound. He can't get loose now if he wants to get loose. His hands are bound. His feet are bound. He can't get loose. And the judgment from the Father is about to fall on him. The judgment's coming down. The knife's fixing to fall. And then he's going to burn him. I mean, judgment's coming. What stops the judgment? What gets this bound individual, this bound victim, out from under the judgment of the Father? <laughs> Come down to verse number 13. Here's what gets him out. Here's the double type. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering. I love the last part of the verse. I love it. In the stead. It's a swap. The bound, condemned, one that's about to die under the judgment of the Father gets set free. And the ram dies in his stead. The condemned goes free. And the free gets condemned. The one that God said should die, didn't die. And the one that should have died, did die. Can you not see the picture tonight? I am Isaac. 
You are Isaac. Here's the secondary type. Not only is Isaac a picture of Christ, Isaac's a picture of me. I was bound in my transgressions, holding by the cords of my iniquity. I could not get loose. And the judgment of God the Father, the wrath of the law and the Father was going to fall on me and I deserved it. But thank God one night a preacher told me about Jesus. Uh, and I deserved to go to hell. I deserved to be punished. But that night he told me about Jesus. He died on a cross for me. That night I went free. And God applied the sacrifice of his son to my account and in my stead Jesus Christ died Jesus just didn't die for nothing he died in the place of somebody else he took your spot your place you should have died he took your place died for you he didn't have to he did it because he loved us gave his life in my stead the Bible said this the just for the unjust. For scarcely for a good man some would die. Yet peradventure for a righteous man some would dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm reminded of a story. I'm, I'm reminded of a story in World War II. They said this young man joined the army, joined the military because he was fleeing justice. Uh, for some crimes that he had committed. He lied on several of his applications. Back in World War II, you can read stories of all kind of people. They were just so anxious to get warm bodies and put them on the front because they just needed to win the war. They really didn't mind where you come from or who you was. He lied on a lot of his documents. They signed him up and put him in the front lines. It just so happens they put him with a man who was a veteran of the military, but he was a good man. He was a man that loved God. And he was very kind. And he was a warrior. They said that young man became, when he had never been close to anyone because of his history and because of his rebellion and what he was running from, he became close to this old man. True story. They said this old man and him began to talk and the young man over months began to uh, divulge his soul and began to just come out with all of who he was and how he lied and how he was fleeing justice. And how if he ever went back, they would catch him and he had joined the military just to try and get out from under the judgment that was awaiting him. They said one night in a firefight, that good man that had invested and tried to help this young man, he was hit and mortally wounded. And as he lay there in his own blood and about to die, the young man sat there and held him in his arms. And they said that older man reached up and pulled him down. And when he did, he grabbed that young man's dog tags and ripped them off reached down and grabbed his dog tag, pulled it off and handed it to the young man. He said, I want you to take my place. When you go back home, I want you to become me. I want you to take a different name. I want you to be able to be something different than you were. Can I say this evening? That's what Jesus Christ did for us yeah. when we were yet sinners and we should have died and gone to hell. And brother, we had the sentence of God on us. Jesus Christ swapped the accounts. God put his, our sin on Jesus and put Jesus' righteousness on us. And Jesus dies and I go free this evening. See Jesus in the burnt offering. What a beautiful picture of the love of the Father, the life of the Son, and the loaning and the lending of the Lord this evening. I don't know what kind of problem you got. I don't know, Christian, what kind of issue you got. But I'll tell you this, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide for it. He'll see to it. I've watched Jehovah Jireh happen not just when I got saved, but since I've been saved, I've watched him provide over and over and over and over again. And that's a whole nother message for a whole nother time. I'm glad to know Jesus was in the burnt offering tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these truths. Help us to be thankful for them. God, everything that I preach tonight pertains to us. We, 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 we are in on it. God, like somebody said, we're all in on the little end of something big. No, oh my, one day the glories and the grace of heaven will reveal truly how wonderful these truths really are. Sometimes, Lord, my mind, my heart can't fathom it. And Lord, I know many times I'm not as appreciative of it as I should be. But great goodness, Lord, one day when I step off into heaven and I see my Savior there and the holes in His hands and in His feet and the hole in His side, and see Him there in the crown of glory, 
uh, King of kings and Lord of lords, I really realize how good it really is. And all you really did for an old sinner like me. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for coming in the fullness of time and giving your life for somebody like Cody Zorn. God, help us to leave here and tell sinners about the good grace of Jesus, the love of God toward us. Oh, God, there ain't nobody you won't save, nobody you don't care about. Help us to go tell everybody, anybody's a candidate for the love of God. Black, white, rich, poor, male, female, everybody's a candidate for the good grace and love of God. Help us to remember that and go tell them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you. You're dismissed.